glad you raised this. It's not just because there's a, an objective testimony in the nature of things, but there's a subjective response, subjective in the sense that we are subject, not subjective in the bad sense of, 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 of we're making it up as we go along. But, but and, and I, this is, I'll say, a footnote. This is one of the great things, I think, about our postmodern moment. The good thing is that we're recognizing, yes, we are. The objectivity of, of value doesn't mean that we are detached observers to creation. We are actually engaged observers, but the engagement does not, does not negate the, the reality that's there. It's for, and that's because, you know, Augustine says, you know, we, let's see, we, we, we believe in order to know. Okay? We orient, our souls are, are we know more and we can perceive these things as our souls are properly oriented, as our as our as our uh, as our affections are properly oriented, I'm getting into your territory, your virtue ethics. <laughs> yeah, I just wondered if you'd studied one or more European country, especially <coughs> say a country where the reform was centered, and how the rationale has evolved modernly to marginalize Christianity. It, have I done that? Yeah. Or what's your awareness of that? Well, uh, not a specific. I mean, I've, uh, not a specific country, and not uh, not. I mean, I think the marginalization happened earlier than we realized. I mean, I think the marginalization. I don't know what period. What period you're thinking about? I mean, you know, if you're thinking of just the 20th century, for instance. See, I think you know we need to remember it was in the 1880s that Nietzsche said God is dead, and what Nietzsche meant was that in most of Europe. The idea of a supreme being ordering reality just was no longer plausible. That's the 1880s. So, so in a sense, that marginalization, and part of what, I will talk a little bit about that tomorrow, not, not with a specific case study of a specific country, but kind of European law, and, and America also. Um, if I don't get to it, uh, one, one resource is a wonderful book called Without God, Without Creed. Uh, by James Turner. It's a history, it came out in the 80s. It's a history of the rise of atheism in America, in particular. That is why, I, th I thought of that book a lot in light of all these books that have come out recently, all these defiantly, evangelistically atheistic books like Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens. Uh, you know, Hitchens has a book called God is Not Good. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's quite remarkable that even as late as the, even as late as the uh, early to mid 19th century, it was hard to find atheists anywhere. Not now atheists, but in a relatively short amount of time, atheism suddenly became an imaginable position, and, and if not an entirely socially acceptable position, uh, in a relatively short amount of time, and uh, and what. Turner is doing that book is basically saying, how did this happen? How did it happen that within a few decades we go from, I mean, even most of the Enlightenment skeptics were not you know, atheists. Uh, so how do you, by the late 19th century, suddenly within 30 or 40 years, and so I won't tell you that, but he, he, he spells that out. And the, the sad thing is the church added momentum to, to the cultural trends. Basically, what one, his main critique is that the church redefined its theology to, to make it more accommodating to a kind of materialistic worldview mm -hmm. and de denuded God of mystery. Basically, tried to present a, a more cultural friendly view of Christianity in order to try to keep more people sympathetic to Christianity. And within a generation or two, why bother? I mean, <laughs> Why bother going to church if all you have to tell me is a religious version of what I already know? And basically, he's talking about what we would call theological liberalism. But um, I mean, there's more to the story than that. But part of part of the story is, in his view, the church redefined its understanding of Christianity and public proclamation of Christianity to make it fit better with secular assumptions that were, let's call them, scientistic. Um, so God is presented as a you know divine engineer. That's what the, the deism has already kind of run its course, but th this becomes 
These aren't theists. These are Christian people that are that are uh, that, that are more and more presenting God in ways that eliminate mystery, eliminate uh, anything that might be offensive to a culture that despises the Christian. Yes, I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to yeah, yeah. short. But uh, the idea of a pastor friend of mine, I think it was the late 1800s, the famous quote, "I think, therefore, I am." He said it's early, that, earlier than that, but he, yeah, he said. He used that as the start of atheism. Well, there's, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a powerful, it's a powerful. Uh, ironically, Descartes. That is, that's one of Descartes. That's basically, ironically, Descartes trying to figure out how can I, how can I live, eliminate skepticism, uh, and he ends up providing an engine for more rampant skepticism <laughs> than ever been the case, because he ends up defining human nature uh, in, in purely rationalistic and, and, and as kind of pure rationality or pure volition. So, so he ends up, again, uh, for the best of intentions, <laughs> well, maybe, <I> don't know. <laughs> but yeah, we'll give him the benefit of that. For the best of intentions, uh, Ends up providing a, a, a momentum uh, that, uh, that that that, uh, that that actually deviates Europe away from its Christian roots. I want to actually close with one one quote from Lewis, uh, and it, it's a quote from uh, it's a quote from uh, Abolition of Man. He talks about early modern science being a mixed movement. That is, there were some people involved in early modern science that had really good motives and good ideas, and there were some that had bad. And he, he says, and this is a wonderful bit of wisdom, kind of general wisdom, we can apply to all sorts of settings in our lives. In every mixed movement, the efficacy comes from the good elements, not from the bad. But if a, if, if a movement is successful in accomplishing something, it's probably because there was some good in it. But the presence of the bad elements is not irrelevant to the direction the efficacy takes. In other words, the, 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 uh, the, the desire to, let's take Kepler's phrase, think God's thoughts after him, or, or, or Bacon's desire to, to alleviate human suffering in, in, in modern science. Those are all admirable rationales for a particular way of studying the world, a particular product. But, there were also a lot of bad elements, and, and, and what Lewis is saying, the power and the glory of this movement came from all the good things. But within, again, a relatively short amount of time, science pits itself up against Christianity. How does that happen? In Lewis's telling, it's because there were bad elements there from the beginning. It was, a, it was a movement, as he says, using another metaphor, it was born in a bad neighborhood at an inauspicious hour. <laughs> It is time to depart. Thank you all. We'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you.